morning. I am reading from the Revised Standard Version that my father gave me in 1957. He got in great trouble with his congregation for bringing out the Revised Standard Version. <laughs> if they could only know how many versions there are now. <laughs> ah, Psalm 112, you can follow in the Pew Bible. I believe it's 434. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. His descendants will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Light rises in the darkness for the upright. The Lord is gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with the man who deals generously and lends, who conducts his affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of evil tidings. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid until he sees his desire on his adversaries. He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted in honor. The wicked man sees it and is angry. He gnashes his teeth and melts away. The desire of the wicked man comes to naught. Thanks be to God. Don't you feel sorry for folks trying to learn the English language? We use ridiculous idioms like, it cost an arm and a leg, or it's raining cats and dogs, or when pigs fly. Yet every language has their own idioms. For instance, in Germany they say, you have tomatoes on your eyes, meaning you are not seeing what others see. In France, the carrots are cooked, meaning the situation can't be changed. In Iceland, I took him to the bakery, means I told him off. Another Icelandic idiom, the raisin at the end of the hot dog, referring to an unexpected surprise at the end of something. In Sweden, there's no cow on the ice, meaning there's no need to worry. We Southerners have our own expressions like, I ain't seen you in a month of Sundays. <laughs> or, his cornbread ain't done in the middle. <laughs> or here's my favorite. If brains were leather, you wouldn't have enough to saddle a June bug. <laughs> Bless your heart. <laughs> Let us pray. Almighty God, King of the universe, pour out your spirit upon us so that we are able to receive and understand your holy word. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Imagine being with Jesus so long ago as he preaches, teaches, and heals in the region of Galilee. You are one of the disciples Jesus calls to follow him. More than anything, you long for the nation's deliverance from corruption and oppression. Sound familiar? You long for the world to be healed of life-threatening viruses and diseases. And you long to be saved from the battles within your own heart and mind. Will Jesus rescue, heal, save, and deliver? Jesus invites you up the mountainside sits down with you and opens his mouth to teach. Are you listening? Hear the word of the Lord from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 3 through 10. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, 
for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Jesus is describing a new way of living. He explains what it looks like to live under the sovereignty of God. Last week, we looked at the first three Beatitudes. The first one says, Oh, the blessedness of the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is teaching the importance of recognizing our own spiritual poverty and our desperate need for God as king. We must be empty to be filled. Are we continually giving up our little kingdoms in order to live in the blessedness of the loving governor of the universe? The second beatitude, Oh, the blessedness of those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Jesus reminds us that sorrow and mourning drives us deep into the comfort and compassion of God as nothing else can. Even in our losses, we have the blessedness and joy of Jesus right beside us, no matter what. Third, oh, the blessedness of the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Allowing God to break our willfulness and teach us balance and control will enable us to live as gentle, joyful, and forever citizens of the kingdom. What do these three Beatitudes have in common? Is Jesus applauding how hard we try or how good we think we are or how carefully we plan our lives when pigs fly? (laughs) Jesus is saying God's kingdom is all about what the Lord is able to do in us and through us. The fourth Beatitude. Oh, the blessedness of those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. In the ancient Middle East, folks were often hungry and thirsty. Wages were extremely low. There were no grocery stores. The hot, dry climate and lack of clean water meant constant thirst and crop failure. They knew what it felt like to be starving and dying of thirst. This is the kind of hunger and thirst Jesus is talking about. He's talking about a desperate longing. I heard a story of a man who is crawling through the desert when another man riding a camel comes near. The first man calls out, Water! Please, can you give me water? The man on the camel replies, I'm sorry, I don't have any water but I'd be delighted to sell you a necktie. The first man responds, I don't need a necktie. I need water. The man continues to crawl through the desert for what seems like days. Finally, parched with thirst, his skin blistered from the sun, he finds himself at a restaurant. With his last bit of strength, he staggers to the door and whispers, Water. I need water. The waiter smiles and says, I'm sorry, sir, neckties are required. (laughs) Jesus is asking, do you have a desperate craving like a starving person for a right relationship with God? Is living in God's kingdom just a nod to what is good? Or do you hunger and thirst for righteousness? Living in God's kingdom is about a growing, intensifying desire for God's purposes. Sadly, we try to satisfy our God-given desires with material things or experiences. But the deep, empty cravings of our soul can only be satisfied with the spiritual. C.S. Lewis wrote, If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that does not prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy, 
but only to arouse, to suggest the real thing. If that is so, I must take care on the one hand never to despise or to be unthankful for these earthly blessings, and on the other never to mistake them for the something else of which they are only a kind of copy or echo or mirage. I must keep alive in myself the desire for my true country, which I shall not find till after death. I must never let it get snowed under or turned aside. I must make it the main object of life to press on to that country and to help others do the same. Oh, the blessedness of those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Fifth, oh, the blessedness of the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Maybe your mama used to shake her head and say, mercy, mercy, when you did something wrong. Maybe she didn't give you the spanking you deserved. God's mercy is not giving us what we truly deserve. Mercy is about showing compassion and forgiveness, even to those who don't deserve it. It's about seeing the pain and deep needs of others and being moved to respond. We are able to respond in mercy when we grasp the mercy we've received from our Lord. Even though every day we forget and disregard God, the mercies of the Lord are new every morning. Do we deserve that? Do we deserve the sacrifice of Jesus taking our place to pay the debt of our sin? Do we deserve God's forgiveness? Showing mercy means releasing the debts of those who have done wrong. It means learning to forgive even when undeserved. This is one of our greatest struggles. We have the hardest time letting go of anger toward those who have wronged us. We grow bitter. It eats at us, growing like a cancer, keeping us awake at night. But you know how that works. Failing to show mercy only traps us in our own misery. Consumed, we develop a victim mentality. We grow judgmental, fault-finding, and even seek retaliation. Jesus is saying to his followers, if you are unable to show mercy, your cornbread ain't done in the middle. <laughs> Don't you see? You're only hurting yourself. Jesus says, let me help you see people through my eyes. Let's see the pain and deep needs of others. Demonstrate compassion even though they are undeserving. Let's do it together. Oh, the blessedness of the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Sixth, oh, the blessedness of the pure in heart, for they will see God. Jesus speaks to his followers steeped in the teachings of the Old Testament law keeping. They believed their salvation was based on keeping all the rules. They were experts on making sure everyone saw how good they were at obeying laws on the Sabbath, about what to eat and about what to wear. But Jesus takes these re religious people to the bakery, telling them off. He says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead man's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Jesus sees deep into our hearts and motives and knows the truth. Well, is anyone pure in heart? Can anyone say they are perfect, unpolluted by the contamination of sin and the brokenness of this world? No, not one. So does this mean that no one can see God? It's helpful to look at the original Greek word for pure, because the original word means we are being made pure. It's about the process, like refining metal, the impurities are burned away, or the washing of dirty clothes, or the sifting of grain. Jesus is teaching his disciples the importance 
of being refined and cleansed. This takes some honest self-examination, and that is always hard because we are experts in deceiving ourselves. We have tomatoes on our eyes. Isn't it true our motives are usually mixed and our hearts divided? Do you have a feeling of self-satisfaction when you give to the poor or make it to church on a cold, snowy day with a pot of soup? Bless your heart. <laughs> Jesus is saying, let me show you the truth. Ask me to point out what is offensive to the holiness of God. Allow me to refine you by giving you a new, pure heart and new desires. Then you will see God, both now with the eyes of faith and finally when you see the Lord face to face. Oh, the blessedness of the pure in heart, for they will see God. Do you see how the teachings and values of Jesus are upside down from the teachings and values of the world? Here is the raisin at the end of the hot dog, the unexpected surprise. Jesus lifts up the poor, those who mourn, the meek, those who are starving, the merciful, and the pure in heart. Do you understand? Life in God's kingdom means God grows larger and larger, and we become less and less. Only then is our Lord able to work in and through us in this broken and fearful world. Only then will we know the blessedness, the deep satisfaction, and the approval of God. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, holy God of the universe, how we thank you for claiming us as your own and for the privilege privilege of being citizens in your kingdom both now and forever. We thank you for the beauty of this day and for all your reminders that you are great, majestic, creative, awe-inspiring, and involved in your good creation. Even though our hearts break at the brokenness of the world today, we thank you for your sovereign hand. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, Change us, O oh Lord. Give us new hearts, hearts like yours. Give us eyes to see as you do with compassion and mercy. Work in us and through us, allowing us to demonstrate Jesus according to your will as you taught.